So it seems in, if one looks at uh, our, the history, the history of any country, uh, when a population, when people are very poor, obviously the, the priority is shelter, food, and warmth. You know, when, when things are very poor, when, when the situation is very simple, when there's oppression or that, uh, then the focus is, is on survival, okay? Survival, we need food, we need shelter, uh, we need fresh water, and that sort of thing. Then as the society develops, now there's time for things like, well, education. And then as the society develops even more, now there's time for recreation, for leisure, for sports, for games. There's also not time for like, things like philosophy and reflection and science. You know, if you're hungry, you don't really care what the structure of an atom is, you know? So, but when, when things, when our society develops, now there's kind of, there's time for, for, for development and for, for, for the, the pursuit of knowledge. So this we, we would have seen in the Romans, Greeks, uh, also over in Asia, China, Japan, when the nations, when they reached a certain kind of level of, of, of autonomy, self-sufficiency, power, or that, now there was time for, for research, for the search for what one would hope is the truth. The, 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 this pursuit of, of, of deeper knowledge, of greater knowledge, of not just like, what are we going to eat today, but why are we here at all? What's the purpose of our existence? What is the truth? You know, there's, there's time for, this, for these kind of questions after society develops. Uh, this was also the case in, in Korea, uh, back in the 17th century, when the country, <clears throat> economically, politically, uh, was doing quite well. And some nobles there, some scholars there, were a little more interested in the outside world. Not something that, that uh, some of the Asian countries would, would have been known for. There was generally, uh, in, in Japan and China, there was generally uh, great skepticism uh, towards the, the outside world, as we'll see a little later. But these Koreans, <clears throat> these scholars, they, were, they wondered, they were hungry for, for knowledge. What, what's everyone else in the world saying? What, are, what does everyone else think? And surprisingly or interestingly, they came across Christian books, also the Bible, from China. So then these Christian books and the Bible were brought into Korea via China, but not via missionaries, via lay people who had these books. So people start to study them, read them, then lay missionaries uh, emerged out of this in all, all the 17th century. And so then uh, a Christian, Christian communities emerged, but that hadn't been founded by uh, priests or religious. So there were Catholic communities there with no priests, but they, they, they studied scripture, they knew who Jesus was, very, very, but not baptized. Probably not, I don't think they were baptized actually. It doesn't, in the accounts I read, it doesn't say if they were baptized or not. Um, so maybe they weren't baptized, maybe some were. But point being, the whole community sprang up as a, as a lay pursuit of knowledge, if you will, pursuit of the truth, and people recognized that what's being taught here, what the church teaches, what the Catholic Church teaches, it's coherent, it makes sense. It respects the dignity of the human being. It also has great hope towards the future, towards the afterlife. It's also, a, uh, even from a human perspective, there's a sense of, of justice. You know, it's not just the rich, or the powerful, or people with a certain surname, or from a certain part of city, or whatever it is, get to heaven. But this is open to all people who do what God wants, irrespective of their, their nationality, or ethnic origin, or wealth, or influence, or whatever it might be. So there's a inherent beauty, and truth, and wisdom in it all. Okay. So... Then when, uh, later on then, uh, in the 18th century, uh, seven, late 17th century, when missionaries arrived from France, they found a community there already of about 4,000 people who knew about Jesus, knew about the church, but had never been, had never, had never actually celebrated Mass, never been to Mass, because they had no priests. Okay, so... While, yes, some scholars uh, were interested in this and some people were very taken by this, uh, as the community grew, it drew the attention of the authorities uh, who, depending on who the leader was, uh, some engaged in a violent, violent persecution of the church on kind of three, three different phases. But during this, uh, a young man named Andrew Kim Taigan uh, felt called to priesthood. 
Incidentally, Andrew had lost his father to uh, Christian persecution. He had lost other family members, including uncles, uh, to the persecution as well. But he decided he wants to become a priest. In Korea, it would have been too dangerous to train to become a priest, so he traveled uh, 1,300 miles, 1, miles into China to, to train to become a priest. He spent six years there and uh, came back, had to find a way back into China where he wouldn't be discovered, back into Korea. Uh, so he made his way back into Korea and began to work there as a priest. And he was the first Korean-born priest working in Korea. You know, like it's just quite an incredible thing. Like the, 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 I said, the Christian community, the Catholic community had existed before that, but he was the first Korean-born priest to work in, in Korea. Uh, so he did so with great zeal and ardor, and obviously the church was uh, an underground church at the time, so he had to travel around incognito, disguise himself and, and, and not get caught by the authorities and so on, celebrate Mass in houses. And after just one year, he was captured, he was imprisoned, uh, he was tortured, and finally beheaded uh, on the riverbanks of, in, in Seoul, in the capital. Now these things, these torturings and beheadings would have been public to dissuade any of the uh, community, any of those watching, to go the same route or to follow the same faith. And he knew this was coming. Like, if you, you, you live like that, you live as a, a, you live during a time of great persecution when you know, especially as a priest, there's a price on your head, right? Because you're, you're one of the leaders of the community. Through you, they, they get like five of the seven sacraments. So if you, can, if you can manage to kill off priests and dissuade anyone else from becoming a priest, that's a great victory if you're, if you're against the church. So working as a priest for just one year, for one year, that's what his priesthood amounted to. But in the sight of God, it was worth it. He now has the crown of martyrdom in heaven. Whenever I read these kind of stories, I read this story when I was in seminary, and uh, it, just, it, it, it stuck with me since then because I just thought, wow, and I think I've got problems. <laughs> you know, I think I've got challenges or difficulties or crosses. And then you read someone's story like this, you know, or many of the martyrs had similar. <clears throat> Ugandan martyrs similarly, uh, even the Jean de Brebeuf and Isaac Jogues over in New York, modern-day Canada. Uh, their, their epic tales of... What, what, what I find very interesting, though, is for many of these first missionaries, see, they don't have the benefit of hindsight. We read their story centuries later, and we read, you know, just in a couple of lines, went to Korea, beheaded, uh, then Catholic community grew greatly after his death. And we go, oh, that's lovely. Because it's all three sentences back to back. Whereas in reality, while the person was doing this, there was no, there wasn't an, an inkling of hope. It's not like, you know, if I die, the Catholic community then will, will develop afterwards and within 10 years it's going to be fantastic here. No, like all you see is a small, good community of people who love the Lord, absolutely. And all around you, an empire that wants you dead and that will probably succeed. And then they capture you, they kill you, and that's all you see, then you're dead. So from an earthly perspective, all you see is a fledgling little community and then you die. What I'm saying is it requires enormous faith to persevere and continue to do this even though you might not see the fruit of any of your labours. That takes huge faith because otherwise, why bother? Save your skin. Save yourself. Go to a country where there isn't persecution. Flee the country. No one would actually blame you. Do you know, people are dying in, like, refugees flee all the time. And it's, you know, it's, it's a normal, well, it's not a normal thing. It's an understandable thing to do if you're being persecuted. If people of your ethnicity or, or colour are being killed in a certain place, it's, it's completely understandable that you would leave that place. 
you know, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a to, to, to preserve yourself, anybody would understand. But to choose not to do that, to choose to stay there with your little community and risk your life every day, that is nothing short of heroic. One of the conditions for, for, for canonization, heroic virtue. So, what about us? What about you and I? In our difficulties and, and crosses, how do we react? Can we react with greater virtue? Is there, is there some obstacle in, in, in our lives, in our day, in our work, in our relationships? Is there some problem there where rather than just seeing it as, as, an, as a, a problem, rather than just seeing it as a cross, to see it as an opportunity where I can grow in virtue. Is there something in my day that the Lord has allowed that I can grow? Is there something I can do? And this is, I think, a very important point as well. I, I think so, sometimes it, we can slip into this uh, mentality of victimhood. So whenever anything goes wrong, you know, there was, there was a girl here a couple of years ago and she used to, she used to say it jokingly, but whenever, something, she, whenever something would go wrong, she'd go, woe is me, I suffer. <laughs> it's probably a quote from something, it sounds Disney, it sounds kind of Cruella de Vil, I don't know. Uh, but she, she, would, she would always quote, she would always, whenever anything would go wrong, you know, we'd be delayed in leaving or whatever. Woe is me, I suffer. Uh, and that can happen to us, you know, when something goes wrong, something... Uh, displeases us or something actually does cause us to proper suffer. It can cause us to close in on ourselves and to slip into maybe even a, a victim mentality, you know, poor me. And that's, again, it's, it's understandable. Nobody likes suffering. But the lives of the saints and the lives of the martyrs maybe in a particular way show us that there is an alternative to say, Lord, whatever you have allowed, I accept and grant that I can see all of these crosses as opportunities to grow in virtue and grant Lord that I may act not just kind of passively you know be hit by life but if there's something I can do that would help if if if, if there's something that that I could do to improve the situation grant me the grace to do it just act And then, Lord, win, lose, or draw, when we stand before you, we do so with no regrets. We do so knowing that we've done our best. We do so knowing that whatever has come to us in our lives, even if it was challenging, we accepted it from the hand of a pierced carpenter. The Lord's pierced hand has allowed these things, so, Lord, we ask you for the grace. To, to carry them as you did, knowing that they serve a greater purpose, knowing that this is all much bigger than us. Help, help us, Lord, to respond with virtuous hearts in all of our difficulties, as St. Andrew Kim did. Amen.